Hello, everyone, and welcome to Renewable Energy from, uh, from Research to Mass Adoption. We'll be getting started in just a minute or so, but while we wait, I'm going to launch a poll. Uh, it's our, our little right here. I'll be interested to hear the, the sense of everyone in the room on how many pe people or what people think the percentage of US electric demand we met by renewable energy sources in 2035. Um, my name is Zachary Eldridge. I'm a technology manager at the U.S. Department of Energy's Solar Energy Technologies Office, and I'll be moderating this session. We have a really great lineup of speakers that um, I at least am going to be happy to uh, introduce to you. And we'll be getting started here in just a couple minutes as we let people join. So if you have a, a uh, vote in the poll in and you'd like uh, to justify it in the chat, um, love to hear what why people are picking uh, what they're picking in, in here as, as the questions come in I'll, I'll eventually display this over can see. Okay, um, Jeremy, could you go ahead and start sharing your screen and we'll, uh, so just, I'll share the results for everyone who would like to see them. It looks like we got about 40% um, is the, the sort of central tendency. A few very older venturing to 60%, uh, one pessimist at, at 20%. Um, uh, how do I? Okay, uh, well, I'll go just go ahead and, and introduce Jeremy and let him get started. So Jeremy Firestone is our first speaker. He's a professor in the School of Marine Science and Policy and the director of the Center for Research in Wind at the University of Delaware. He focused primarily on understanding public attitudes towards reactions to and behaviors regarding renewable energy technologies. So I will kick off to Jeremy and let him get us started. Thank you. Okay, thank you and uh, welcome everyone and uh, good morning. Uh, as he said, I'm Jeremy Firestone at the University of Delaware. Uh, I want to really acknowledge my two uh, co-authors who I owe a large debt to. First, my former master's student, uh, Sam Bingaman, who's really the, the lead author on this study. And then uh, David Bidwell, uh, a colleague who I work with quite a bit from the University of Rhode Island, who really came up with the, the idea to include this aspect in our uh, survey instruments. Um, so let me get to the next slide. So. Uh, a little context on offshore wind. We've got 42 megawatts installed. Uh, we've got 100x that planned. Um, we're gonna talk today about the 30 megawatts uh, at Block Island, Rhode Island, uh, five wind turbines, six megawatts each. Uh, but you can see we really have an industry in the making with experienced European uh, developers. Uh, and then we've got a lot of the Atlantic coast states in the game. And, uh, a number of Pacific Coast states and, and the Gulf of, and sort of Texas, Louisiana um, in, in the Gulf. Uh, so we're really focusing on the, the social acceptance of offshore wind. It's generally high, uh, but we've seen that opposition can stall uh, or contribute to project cancellation. Uh, certainly that was the, the case with the Cape Wind project. Um, a gap that we're trying to uh, fill here is really the dearth of understanding how attitudes change uh, over time. Um, indeed, we believe that with more longitudinal research, the planning processes can result in both uh, more successful uh, and more fair uh, projects. Um, so again, the setting is, is Block Island, Rhode Island. It's uh, an island off the coast of uh, Rhode Island. Uh, you can see it's uh, somewhat unusual for the East Coast, more perhaps typical of the West Coast with having a, 
uh, high bluff, and indeed that's where the offshore wind turbines are off, uh, off that bluff. Um, the island is quite special, about half of it is protected space, it's got 27 kilometers of beaches, uh, and the project is sited in state waters, uh, in state water, that means it has to be within five, basically three nautical miles, so it's about five kilometers, uh, the island to the project, whereas the closest point, Point Judith on the coast is 26 kilometers. So we did a longitudinal study, uh, we've got about 400 block Islanders and mainland coastal residents. These are in census tracts. We sampled them in 2016, just before the turbines were installed, 2017, right after commissioning, and then a year later. Uh, we continued this longitudinal focus by doing interviews in uh, 2020 of 23 of the survey takers. So we've got three research questions. The first is pretty straightforward. Do attitudes change over time? Uh, the second was, was attitude shift influenced by attitude strength attributes? Here we rely on a paper by Visser et al. from 2006. Attitude strength is really a branch of uh, psychological research. Uh, we know that some attitudes are durable and resist change and remain stable while others fluctuate. Uh, it's theorized that with the stimulus, in this case the stimulus being a wind turbine project, Attitudes are more likely to change if prior to the stimulus, an individual was less confident in their views, had discussed it less with peers, uh, would, would have less direct effect on them and had less knowledge about the project. And then third, um, one of the things we're able to do because we have this sort of before and after is uh, look at how perceptions of visibility and fit match with uh, what happened in reality and how those uh, impact uh, attitudes. So we, we grouped our folks into really five buckets um, and two large buckets. So the two large buckets are those that stayed stable and those that shifted. Uh, you can see just from looking at this that there was strong overall uh, support and most people didn't change their opinion from before the time the turbines were put in the water uh, till afterwards. But um, 66 shifted positively and 19 shifted uh, negatively. Um, but the real question, well, is why? Uh, and here we first go back to these attitude strength uh, attributes. Um, and for the three of our metrics, basically the three except for direct effects, we find that uh, opposers followed by supporters display higher means in our descriptive analysis and are significant in our uh, multinomial logistic regression models. Uh, indeed, in our interviews, we actually see attitude crystallization with supporters as they became more set in their opinions over time. Shifters fell below these levels of uh, opposers and supporters with the undecided exhibiting the lowest levels of confidence, discussion, um, and in particular knowledge uh, over time. Um, so through the surveys and the interviews um, and, and based it through our descriptive analysis and our multinomial logistic, we're able to sort of think about the, these, these five groups. Uh, those who were opposed uh, tend to, tended to see the planning process as being clandestine, not take, undertaken in good faith and the landscape being tainted by the wind turbines. Uh, those who were supportive throughout really saw the project as part of the collective good, while those who remained unsure, um, they were sort of unknowledgeable before, didn't really seem to gain much knowledge thereafter, they had uncertainties throughout. In contrast, attitude shifters were more prone to balance the shortcomings of the development process and aesthetics with local and global benefits than the other subgroups, resulting in feelings of either feeling better off and hence a positive shift or left behind and those people shifted negatively. Shifters to us seem to be waiting to pass judgment and whether the project benefits would outweigh what some saw as dubious politics and perceived backroom dealings by the time of operation. So then our, our third question really relates to uh, turbine visibility, could you see them or not? Uh, what did you think of their appearance? And what did you think about their fit uh, with the landscape? 
Um, and we see that uh, with opposition, um, they had both poor expected and realized extensive visibility appearance uh, and fit. Uh, the opposers were most likely to dislike the appearance and fit of the turbines. Sometimes they even described them as eyesores or tarnished to the landscape regardless of whether they lived on the island and thus say five kilometers away or further away at 26. As one person said, put them in a de desert someplace where nobody's looking at them. I think the people on land might have in the in desert southwest may have a different view. Uh, negative attitude shifters experienced poorer perceptions of fit with the landscape uh, than they what they expected. And conversely, positive shifters experienced better fit than expected. So that leads to my uh, recommendations, and then I'll wrap up. So one, uh, society should use these existing projects like the Block Island projects in, in addition to just using photo montages. This stems from our feeling that there were differences pre between perceptions and reality of fit. Uh, information knowledge should be shared wide widely. EISs should be looked at as a positive tool, not as a regulatory inconvenience. Um, government and industry needs to continue to maintain uh, trust. That means to continue to uh, engage the public throughout the process, the process being not ending at commissioning, but happening through operation as well. And then lastly, um, as I said, we're about to embark on a large experiment and funders and researchers need to capitalize on this opportunity now to collect some baseline social science data. I look forward to your uh, questions when we reach that phase. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Is there any question? Uh, Patty asks, the respondents who shifted their views, where did they start? At the opposite side, or did they all come from the unsure bucket? Um, some went who shifted positively, started in the, uh, in the negative bucket and shifted to unsure. Others shifted all the way to positive, and then some of the unsure shifted to positive as well. And the same thing happens uh, the other way as well. We didn't have enough data to really analyze it, those sort of finer gradations. And so we ended up bucketed in, into, into the five groups for the analysis. All right, well, we will move right along into our next um, presentation. If we have any time left after presentations, we can maybe revisit questions for all presenters. Um, our next presenter is Jonathan Erickson. So I invite him to start sharing his screen and I will launch um, the poll. So um, Jonathan Erickson is a cognitive scientist with more than a decade of experience using virtual reality to study visual perception, human computer interaction and user experience design. He'll be talking about using virtual reality to examine public attitudes towards offshore wind projects. And we have the results of your poll, John. It looks like um, about two thirds of the people that we have on the call here do live or vacation near the coast. Um, as a native Oklahoman, that sounds very strange to me. The beach is far away and alien. Uh, so I'll hand it off to you to present now. Great, thanks very much, Zachary. Uh, before I get started, can folks see my title slide? Yes. Yes, okay. So the title of our talk today is Using Virtual Reality and Discrete Choice Tasks to Examine Public Attitudes Towards Offshore Wind Energy Projects. And for context, the United States Department of Energy recently announced an offshore capacity goal of 30 gigawatts by 2030 and 110 gigawatts by 2050. And this will require tremendous growth beyond seven turbines currently installed at Block Island. And public opposition remains a primary barrier to increased adoption. Developers are revising some projects, for example, to replace 10 megawatt turbines with 12 megawatt turbines. And these small changes in nameplate capacity can lead to more energy production. Yet communities are concerned about potential visual impacts of turbines. For example, are these larger turbines uh, more visually obtrusive on the horizon? So we examined this through a visual discrete choice study where we asked which visual characteristics of projects matter and particularly, we examined distance, the number of turbines, the size of the turbines. And we had two groups uh, that either saw birds in the images or not to, to probe uh, how that might impact 
their responses. And then in experiment two, we compared <clears throat> the effect of presenting turbines through different media, including virtual reality, 360 video, traditional 2D video, and photos. I'll start with experiment one. This was a visual discrete choice study. We created a series of realistic images that were geographically generic and that didn't include any textual or verbal descriptions. This mirrors how people see wind projects in a landscape without knowing the exact nameplate capacities or exact distances from shore. Our first research question was how important is distance? So we created images that have four different uh, distances of the projects from shore. We also asked, are larger turbines more obtrusive? We looked at eight megawatt versus 14 megawatt turbines. And we also manipulated project size in these images. So we had 420 uh, and 840 megawatt projects depicted. And then we had two groups, one group that was exposed to birds in the images and one not. To create the images, we used a combination of 3D modeling software to place turbines, simulate the Earth's curvature, and to add atmospheric perspective, familiar size cues, and manipulate the presence of birds in the images. So here's an example of one of the images. We had 32 of them. They are high resolution JPEGs, half included birds. Uh, in this image, you can see some birds. The distance is, in this case, is five nautical miles from shore, 14 megawatt turbines. There are 60 of them. So we exposed uh, participants to these images, 262 participants, uh, randomized to the birds and no birds conditions. And in the entrance survey, we provided definitions of onshore and offshore wind and asked for self-rated attitudes towards renewable energy and non-renewable energy. And then in the exit survey, we asked whether they saw turbines uh, gauge their visual acuity and asked for demographic information. So in the choice tasks, participants completed a series of these tasks where they were presented with random pairs of images. And they were asked if a wind project was planned in your community, which option would you prefer? And what we found by looking at these preferences was that distance matters. So coastal visitors, uh, for coastal visitors, five nautical miles and 10 nautical miles was less preferred than projects that were located farther out at 20 nautical miles. And for coastal residents, uh, this preference extended out to 15 nautical miles. We found no turbine size preference between eight megawatts versus 14. And we found that smaller projects overall were preferred. And this could be due to the number of turbines. It could be due to visual crowding or the horizontal span of the project on the horizon. And we found a stronger negative reaction to images that included birds in them. Uh, particularly when turbines were closer to shore at five and 10 nautical miles. So in sum, in the first study, we found that distance mattered the most, uh, followed by project size and followed by turbine size, uh, which mattered almost not at all. And then uh, birds led to more negative responses. In experiment two, we asked what's the effect of the medium that we use to present uh, projects. Previously, in work recently published in Energy Research and Social Science, we conducted a study examining cinematic virtual reality, which is 360 video displayed over a virtual reality headset. And we asked, what's the impact of cinematic virtual reality on attitudes towards renewable and non-renewable energy? We filmed a coastal turbine, had 101 students participate in person. They viewed the turbine in the VR headset and this simulated the sights and sounds of this coastal turbine. And what we found previously was that uh, we found more positive uh, pre-post shift in attitudes towards renewable energy, a negative pre-post shift in attitudes towards non-renewables. And this experience corrected expected noise levels, and the changes were the largest for those who were least knowledgeable about wind energy. Taken together, this suggests, suggested to us uh, cinematic virtual reality as a potential tool for participatory prototyping. And in our more recent study uh, that we're, we're just starting to analyze some data from, uh, this is comparing a cinematic VR to 360 video, 2D video, and photos. And some of these conditions were conducted online versus in the laboratory. 
And what we found, um, just to share some results with you in response to an item, uh, I'm in favor of wind energy, to what extent do you agree or disagree? We found a positive pre-post shift for cinematic virtual reality and 360 video, uh, but not for the other media types. <clears throat> when we asked how loud were each of the following aspects of the scene, and our participants indicated how loud they thought the turbines, ocean, wind, and other aspects of the scene were, we found that wind turbines were perceived to be the quietest aspect of the scene in the cinematic VR condition, followed by the online 360 video and our laboratory-based uh, 2D video conditions. So the turbines got quieter as our uh, participants perceived the turbines to be louder, rather, as the media became less immersive or quieter as the media were more immersive. And so to sum up, we found that visual characteristics of projects are important, particularly distance and projects farther from shore greater than 10 nautical miles were preferred overall. Smaller projects were also preferred over larger projects and we saw stronger negative reactions that were primed by including birds in the images, especially when projects were depicted close to shore. And finally, we found more immersive media was associated with more positive attitudes towards wind, perceiving the turbines and perceiving the turbines to be quieter. And this uh, to us suggests that cinematic VR presented through a headset or a 360 video presented on a desktop computer, for example, may be better for participatory prototyping than 2D video and photos, especially because they can realistically uh, in, in, um, depict the uh, sights and sounds of a real uh, wind project. Thanks very much. Thank you, John. Are there any questions from the audience? One question I had was, um, were there any uh, potential pitfalls that you saw in those virtual reality presentations in terms of, uh, we, we've heard that the, there's these benefits, but what are some of the downsides? Yeah, potential downsides to using virtual reality. Um, the main ones that come to mind can be um, that when you present projects in virtual reality, you have to manage things like the potential for motion sickness, um, which is quite easily done actually. But uh, for example, if you were to have people put on a virtual reality headset and they were seated and there's motion in the scene, they're more likely to experience motion sickness, for example, than if they're standing up and they can move around and look around as they ordinarily would. Thank you, that's very interesting. Okay, we'll move on to our next presentation. Thank you, John. Um, next presentation comes from Eileen Hannigan. I'm going to launch uh, a poll related to Eileen's work as we get her slide deck shared and up here. Eileen Hannigan is a principal at Illum Advising. She applies her social science training to understand the upsides and downsides of behaviors and technologies for our clean energy future. Her presentation is uh, Community Solar, Ensuring a Place for Everyone in a Clean Energy Future. Um, and I will let her go ahead and get started. We're only just getting a few respondents on the poll, so I'll, I'll, I'll share this after some more come in. All right, and just a quick check that you can hear me and see my correct screen. Great. Um, so thanks for the introduction. I am here today to talk about how voluntary clean power programs can expand opportunities for utility customers to participate in clean energy beyond rooftop solar. So I guess that's a shift from the previous speakers. We're shifting away from wind and talking about solar. So historically, rooftop solar programs have only been accessible to a smaller, wealthier group of homeowners. Um, while typically excluding many, for instance, folks with shady homes, people for whom the upfront cost is a barrier, older homeowners who might move before benefiting um, you know, from the payback of a solar system, renters, condominium owners. Um, but there are expanding opportunities for people who cannot install their own rooftop solar to support clean energy generation. And one way to do that is participation in um, in clean and voluntary clean power programs. So today I want to share some key findings that we learned from some recent primary research and from reviewing national research on customer needs and perceptions of clean power programs. 
So just to start with some definitions that I'll be, terms I'll be using today. So voluntary clean power market. Um, this refers to markets that allow consumers to support renewable energy at levels you know, above what their utility is mandated to do and includes options such as green pricing programs, community choice aggregation, um, and where these are an option, competitive suppliers that offer green power products. Uh, green pricing programs that I'll be referring to a bit today are an option where customers pay a premium on their electric bill to support the development of renewable energy sources and the utility typically uses that premium to retire RECs on behalf of the customer. Um, and finally, community solar is where customers can buy or lease a portion of solar panels and an offsite array. And then they may receive a credit on their electric bill for electricity generated by those solar panels. Um, and these um, options have been growing. The National Renewable Energy Laboratory has been tracking the voluntary clean power market for a couple of decades and reported in 2019 that the number of customers participating in green pricing programs uh, surpa surpassed 1 million. But while that's a lot of growth, there's still a lot of opportunity and some utility programs struggle to be fully subscribed. And really for programs to be successful, uh, utilities, program administrators, need to be thinking about a cross section of the customer population and targeting them with the right to messaging and outreach to reach participation goals. So in early 2021, uh, we surveyed 540 voluntary clean power participants and non-participants from a Southeastern utility territory about their interests and experiences in clean power offers. And the offers available to these customers are premium programs, so those green pricing type programs allow customers to purchase blocks of renewable energy or to offset up to 100% of their usage through solar. We also reviewed national and regional research. So taking into account both the primary research and the secondary research, I'm presenting some of our key takeaways. And I would note that while our primary research focused on green pricing programs, you know, I would say that many of these findings are transferable to thinking about other types of voluntary clean power programs, such as community solar. All right, so to get into our findings. So our first finding is not a huge surprise, um, but consistent with you know, research from other regions. The customers we surveyed were motivated by supporting renewable energy production, reducing their carbon footprint, and helping to fight climate change. So those clean power values resonate with customers. And this is true of more than 50% of current participants um, and also non-participants um, who found the offers appealing. Also notable, about half of current participants had looked into solar for their own home before participating in one of the clean power offers. So participants that looked into solar but then went on to participate in the green pricing program, you know, noted that installing their own rooftop solar, you know, they used phrases like not an option. And the program was a green pricing program was an easy way to support solar without the hassle of installing their own panels. Our second main finding, customers value local renewable energy, but many will accept sources outside their state. So we did hear diverging opinions on the importance of local when choosing to participate in a clean power program. About half of non-participating customers who are who are interested in these offers cited local generation of energy as important. And that's often a selling point for things um, like community solar. But among the current participants, you know, many of whom may be considered sort of early adopters of thinking about renewable energy, you know, more than half named local clean power as an important factor in their decision, but most, 80%, would still participate even if their energy source came from outside their state. So, so there is some room if um, programs become, you know, robustly subscribed to look at energy sources outside one's own state. Our third key finding, um, make sure customers understand how the programs work uh, financially. So while well, some customers had a sophisticated understanding of how the cost of the premium programs affected their bills, most customers did not. These are kind of complicated programs. Um, and in fact, we found that less than half of participants from the two different offers were clear that participation resulted in an additional charge on their bill. Um, and some commented, you know, that they were uncertain how their bills would compare to what they would pay if they're not participating in the program. So, you know, that's just a reminder that, you know, utility bills are complicated. These programs add a level of 
um, complication to bills and that to ensure a good customer experience, it's important to understand for participants and potential participants to understand how they work. Um, our next key finding, um, current participants don't reflect the population, but there's many indications that it doesn't have to stay that way. So in our study, current participants are more likely to be young, wealthy, white, with a college degree, and to be homeowners. But among non-participants who found the offers appealing, the group was more diverse, you know, more moderate income, more likely to be renters. Um, when we reviewed national research, that research was divided. Some studies find that higher income customers are more likely to be interested in clean energy programs, while others found that education is a stronger determinant of interest. But I wanted to particularly call out two national studies that I think really challenge our perceptions about who is concerned about climate and who supports climate related programming. So the first from the Yale Project on Climate Change in the American Mind, uh, you know, found that Latino and African Americans tend to be more concerned about climate change than white Americans. And then this uh, second study, another national study, asked a large diverse group of people about their interest and concern for the environment and their perceptions of others' concerns, and found that across all groups, people consistently underestimated the concerns of Latino, Afri African American, and lower income Americans. So it really points that to you know, the finding that there's an opportunity for clean power programs to message to a wide array of customers um, you know, maybe break out of our usual kind of targeting, um, modeling, and, um, you know, not just market to customers who are typically perceived to be more interested in these offers. Um, finally, um, lead by example. Customers want to know that, you know, we're in this together, that their utility is doing its part. Customers who are, you know, committed to clean energy, this is really important. Um, to know that the utility is also participating. The customers we spoke to are looking for the, your, their utility to be pitching in and leading the way and not making it solely the customer's responsibility. So demonstrating how the utility is supporting a clean energy future is critical to winning over customers, especially to green pricing programs that are asking customers to pay a premium for renewable energy. So just to sum up the key takeaways, you know, first, um, we don't need to shy away from promoting clean power values in marketing and communications around um, these type of voluntary clean energy programs. Local clean power is important, but um, expanding to other sources in the region if demand is high may also be okay. Uh, the programs can be complicated, so making sure customers understand how the programs work is critical to a good customer experience. Think outside the typical targeting. We can include more um, folks with climate forward messaging using messaging and images that resonate with a wide range of customers. Um, and finally, lead by example, uh, making and highlighting investments in clean power uh, from utilities is uh, very important. All right, so thank you. Thank you very much, Eileen. Does anyone have a question for Eileen before we move on to the next speaker? Well, Eileen, and, and, and I think you can continue to engage with people if they ask questions in chat. Uh, thank uh, John for doing that as well. But you know, you mentioned one thing is that people have trouble understanding how these green pricing programs work. Uh, what aspects were most confusing? And do you have any suggestions for how we might do a better job of communicating about those aspects in particular? Yeah, I think there's because there's a lot of layers to the programs, you know, where is the energy coming from, uh, what's a rack, how does that work, um, and I would say the, you know, utilities that I've seen that have been maybe, maybe more successful, you know, just do a lot with like visuals on their website, really simple um, uh, videos um, that explain how they work, and I think just being really crystal clear. Um, and particularly if messaging starts to um, target more you know, moderate income folks being really clear that it is a premium program for, for the cases where it is. Thank you. Well, we will now move on to our next talk from Stacey Peterson. I also want to credit all our speakers for doing an amazing job of staying on time um, under current conditions. Uh, so Stacey Peterson, Daniel Miskell will be speaking from the National Center for Appropriate Technology. 
Um, National Center for Appropriate Technology uh, is running a program called the AgriSolar Clearinghouse, which is working on ways to develop connections between solar energy and sustainable agriculture for a low carbon future. So I will hand it off to, uh, I think, Danielle first. You're muted, Danielle. Um, Danielle and I will both be speaking about the AgriSolar Clearinghouse today. Um, Danielle, I'll hand it off to you. Danielle, you are still muted in the Zoom app, it looks like. Hi, sorry about that. It would not let me unmute myself. Um, hi, my name is Danielle Miska, and I am the uh, Senior Energy Engineer for uh, NCAT, and I'm also the Project Coordinator for um, the AgriSolar Clearinghouse, and apparently it's reading, <laughs> can everybody see that on the bottom? I don't know how to stop that, so I apologize for this. Would you like me to re-share my screen somehow, Zach, or just leave it? I think it's fine, uh, arguably an accessibility benefit. So if it's not too distracting to you. It's fine. I'm really sorry about this little technical difficulties. Um, anyways, so uh, Stacy, did you get a chance to introduce yourself? Uh, sure, I'm Stacy Peterson. I'm the energy program director at the National Center for Appropriate Technology. And I'm the principal investigator for the AgriSolar Clearinghouse and the director of the Clearinghouse. Um, I'll, I'll come back on and talk in a moment after Danielle uh, introduces AgriSolar. Yes. All right, so what is AgriSolar? So AgriSolar is the co-location of solar and agriculture. So basically we are utilizing the area beneath and surrounding the solar PV systems for agricultural operations. Uh, so what are the benefits of AgriSolar? Uh, there's quite a bit. So diversified revenue uh, can be for farmers, for the solar industry and for communities. Uh, we have additional funding sources can be available to both the solar industry and the agricultural industry. Uh, they can now apply for REIT grants and solar can apply for conservation grants. Uh, renewable energy grants can be available to farmers. Uh, the egg site can also take advantage of tax and utility incentives. Uh, we're hoping that AgriSolar can provide for habitat preservation and ecosystem services. It can promote pollinators such as bees, birds, butterflies, etc. Um, it helps decrease solar resistance by adding that beautification to the uh, system. So we're going to have grasses underneath, grazing animals underneath, pollinators. Um, it also can help with season extension. So especially in like extreme heat, like Arizona or cold climates where you get a lot of snow. Uh, it can provide shade for animals and also farmers who work long hot days in the field. Uh, there's reduced land use competition. And for the solar industry, it really helps reduce site pre preparation, such as excavating and leveling a whole land. You can just leave the, gla the grasses. Um, maintenance, so you can use grazing instead of mowing. And really, the need to clean the panels and dust suppression. So. Um, we're hoping it will help address climate issues by encouraging more renewables and making them more accessible. So um, in order to promote these benefits, uh, NCAT, along with the Department of Energy's CETO office, have created this AgriSolar Clearinghouse. And it is a uh, relationship building, information sharing network that we hope encourages the adoption of AgriSolar. Okay. And Stacy will help okay. explain a little well, bit more about it. So in developing the AgriSolar Clearinghouse, which is an information sharing, relationship building communications hub, we've partnered with organizations throughout the country. We've partnered with the national labs like Argonne, NREL, and Oak Ridge, um, lead researchers in AgriSolar around the country, um, University of Arizona, Cal Poly, George Washington University, um, renewable energy advocates around the country, and then groups like the Center for Rural Affairs and the Smithsonian. And together, we are hoping to promote AgriSolar throughout the country and support its practitioners, researchers, and enthusiasts. 
Uh, we just made the website live this morning. We're incredibly excited about that. There's the website address down at the bottom and we'll give it again at the end of the presentation. Uh, if you wanna go to the next slide, I will talk about a couple features. As we've been building out the AgriSolar website, we've developed a stakeholder group. And the stakeholder group includes folks that will be using the clearinghouse um, avidly. And we wanna make sure that we're providing practical information for them that they find useful. We have groups like the American Solar Grazing Association, American Farmland Trust, the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund and Pollinator Partnership, and then energy groups like NL um, are our stakeholders. Uh, we've developed a media hub that has publications. We'll be creating a podcast here in the spring, probably debut it in the summer, videos and webinars, and then we curate agrisolar news like the AP article that was out last week about NL's great work with the Inspire Project. Uh, we will be providing technical assistance via chat, eight to five, Monday through Friday. We also have uh, an email that, that will answer regularly and um, an 800 number. Uh, we have an information library, which is like a one-stop shop of peer-reviewed information on AgriSolar. This is pretty new, um, a pretty new practice. So there's a lot of new cutting edge research, which is really interesting and exciting. So there's no one place that you can really go for that until now. So man, we're really excited to present that. I'll talk a little bit about the peer to peer network on the next slide if you want to go to it. So in addition to the website, um, we are also encouraging um, adoption of AgriSolar through fostering relationships, uh, things like our peer to peer network where we'll, we will be connecting mentee facilities. So folks that want to adopt AgriSolar um, with existing AgriSolar facilities will facilitate that relationship for the first few meetings, make sure that, that the relationship is working, that they're both getting what they want, and then we'll step back and let them have a peer-to-peer -peer relationship to learn from each other. We'll also be conducting field trips around the country. Um, we're hoping for at least 10 a year in different areas around the country so everyone can have an opportunity to join in. We'll be videotaping those and making that available on the website so it's accessible to all. Uh, we'll have a user forum um, it's not quite live yet, but it will be this month. Um, we'll attend conferences like this one, and we'll be developing best practices with our partners. We're also, and we have joined, and we're promoting networks like the American Solar Grazing Association and the Inspire Project to develop a strong network. Go to the next slide. So there's a lot of opportunities for behavior change in this because it's such a a new practice and um, folks are really enthusiastic about it. It's really interesting. It solves a lot of different issues in, in this space. And we at NCAT see ourselves as a trusted practical connector of sustainable energy and sustainable agriculture information. So we think that we're ideal for this space to help connect folks. We're hoping to connect practitioners with researchers, industry with farmers, policymakers with enthusiasts. And we're hoping that you will come join our network. We're hoping that you'll go to our website, that you'll email us, that you'll join our forum, and that you'll give us any kind of ideas you have for things that we should include within our network and our website. And on the last slide, our question slide, um, there's our contact information and our website. Like I say, we made it live this morning, so we're really excited to hear from you, and we hope you'll join us. Thanks. Thank you very much, Stacey. I've just discovered that your website is blocked by DOE's internal filters, so we'll have to fix that because it's too ironic to stand. Does anyone have any questions for Stacey? Well, one question I have maybe is, um, ah, uh, one question that we have in the chat is if, whether or not there's any relationship with uh, NRCS and DOA. I don't know if that's the Department of Agriculture, um, but the, do you have any relationship with the NRCS? Yes, we do. Uh, we have relationship with, and if they mean USDA, um, we, we do as well. At NCAT, we have a program called the ATRA program, um, and that is a, we, we, we have other, other sustainable ag programs as well, but we work very closely with USDA and we work with NRCS also. Um, and, and that is in our sustainable agriculture program. So we, we do have a really nice network there. Um, that's been going for over 20 years. Um, so we have a really wide 
reach in sustainable agriculture. And we're really hopeful that we can bring a lot of sustainable agriculture folks into the clearinghouse and promote um, the clearinghouse that way and AgriSolar. All right, thank you. Well, Stacey, we were getting a couple of the questions in the chat, so perhaps we can address them there as we move on to our, our last okay. speaker, um, Vanya Fong from Guidehouse. Um, so the as a discussion question, as we get set up here, uh, I encourage people to put in the chat um, factors you consider when purchasing an energy efficiency upgrade uh, for your home or other kind of business. And meanwhile, we'll, I'd invite Vanya to start sharing her screen. Uh, Vanya Fong is a senior consultant at Guidehouse, focusing on DER forecasting and data analytics. And she's one of the lead modelers in the energy efficiency potential study um, that she'll be talking about. It's demonstrated a novel approach to modeling preference-based customer adoption. Vanya, I can confirm that your uh, slides are showing. So I'll hand it off to you. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Zach. Um, hi, everyone. Um, good to be here. Um, I'm, I'm Vanya Fong, Senior Consultant at Guidehouse, and today I'll be talking to you about improving energy efficiency forecasting with behavioral insights. Um, so this uh, study was a collaboration between Opinion Dynamics and was funded by the California Public Utilities Commission as part of an energy efficiency potential study. So here's a quick summary of our goals and approach for the study. So energy efficiency potential forecasting has traditionally applied, um, relied on purely economic parameters to model customer adoption. So this study really demonstrates uh, kind of a new approach to modeling customer willingness to adopt in DR potential studies that considers both <coughs> economic and non-economic factors when modeling adoption. So as part of this potential study, we partnered with Opinion Dynamics to conduct a market study to collect data on customer preferences and attitudes, which informed inputs to our model. Our hope was really to develop results that better capture you know, the full range of customer decision-making considerations. Um, so this slide summarizes the steps that we took to field the survey, aggregate survey results, um, generate customer preference weights, and conduct the adoption modeling. So customer preference weights kind of symbolize kind of how much each person cares about each factor, for example, upfront cost or environmental friendliness. Um, and these weights are combined with technology characteristics, uh, which were generated through separate research. Together, these weights and characteristics um, create inputs for the market share logic. And I'll talk a little bit more in detail about each of these steps in the upcoming slides. So for our market adoption study, our key objectives were really to collect customer characteristics and attitudes um, to determine their you know, attitudes towards environmental concerns and energy efficient appliances. And our second main goal was to conduct customer segmentation to group uh, customers with similar preferences in the single family sector. Um, this slide lists out so the topics that we, were cover we covered in the survey um, as well as the sample size for each of our segments. So our first goal uh, to understand to what extent customers consider certain parameters when making a decision um, to go forward with energy efficient equipment. Um, so they were asked about the importance of each of these factors, lifetime costs, upfront costs, uh, environmental impacts, um, perceived uh, uh, perception of being environmentally or socially responsible, um, the amount of hassle that uh, a certain adoption would cause, and non-consumption performance was kind of a catch-all um, to uh, really uh, um, to consider kind of energy benefits, aesthetics, and other features. So for example, uh, a, a survey question that would be tied to hassle factor would be, on a scale of one to five, how important is ease of installation? Um, and how important is that to a decision to upgrade or replace an energy efficient appliance? So our second goal for the market study, like I said before, um, was to conduct some customer segmentation. So uh, opinion dynamics, uh, we feel worked on the survey. Um, they also applied latent class analysis, which is the statistical method 
um, to essentially group customers based on their preferences and attitudes. And the inputs that went into that analysis include you know, attitudes towards environmental preservation, energy use, conservation, uh, purchasing decisions, et cetera. And we found that there were you know, four main clusters that we could group folks into, average Americans, um, eager adopters, uh, likely laggards, and environment, economically strained environmentalists. And they all have slightly different ways of perceiving environmental issues and um, also um, different abilities and perceptions towards energy efficiency. So once we had mapped each respondent to a customer segment, um, we developed an average preference score for each value factor based on the survey responses. Um, so you'll notice across the board that environmental impact is really important. And I think that kind of speaks to the importance of this study and really considering more than just um, economic parameters in customer adoption. So I have a similar slide on customer, uh, on commercial, um, but that's, uh, I have that slide in the appendix if folks are interested. So we, we had individual value factor scores and to translate these individual scores into a relative weight to kind of really holistically capture um, a customer preference. Um, we turn these into percentages um, that sum up to 100. So you can interpret this percentage as kind of a percentage of someone's decision that's driven by each factor. Now that we have the weightings, which is uh, essentially kind of how much someone cares about each factor, then we need something to apply those weightings to. So this is where the technology characteristics come in. So for each equipment and value factor, we developed a metric that indicated the magnitude of that characteristic relative to the other equipment that that um, measure was competing against. So, um, so these equipment would be kind of the equipment that customers are choosing when they're making adoption decision uh, for a replacement or upgrade. Um, so for example, um, the way that we calculated the, the value for an LED, the co lifetime measure cost for an LED was dividing that cost by the average of all the costs for all the equipment in its competition group. And to put it all together, we took the preference weights and the characteristics. Um, and there is one for each of these factors that you can see here. Um, and we applied those to each other to generate a single weighted value that's then fed into a decision model that then um, calculates the market share of each of these equipments within that competition group. For example, the fluorescence LEDs and the more efficient LEDs, that could be one competition group. So in summary, we are, this approach provides the foundation for better integrating behavioral science concepts into DER forecasting models, which have traditionally relied on less sophisticated approaches of um, assessing customer adoption. So really novel to demonstrate a method to um, include additional non-economic parameters um, into our forecasting and also do some customer segmentation based on uh, attitudes and preferences. Um, so our goal is to more reliably forecast the ER adoption in response to specific program interventions and capture um, things that people value beyond just maybe upfront incentives or costs. That's my presentation. Thanks for, thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one question in chat already. I'm sure more will, or more may come in, but the first question we have is, was the sample representative of the state of California? Uh, this would be representative of the um, IOUs, service territories in California. I see. So not California as a whole, but of the, the particular utility service territories that you focused on. Right. Mm -hmm. Other questions? And if anyone wants to put a question in chat for a previous speaker, we do have a couple minutes so we can um, revisit something.
Well, one question I have for, for sort of all panelists is, um, you know, many of you have been working in this field for years. How do you feel about the, the course of the last, let's say, five or six years? What kind of changes do you see in the renewables market um, compared to where we were um, even just a few years ago? In terms of attitudes or behaviors of the general public? I think, you know, AgriSolar has been a, a, a big mover in the last, you know, five to six years. So that, that's been something that's been really interesting um, at NCAT to watch. A lot of the work we've done has been in energy efficiency and in solar only. Um, but then we also have another part of our company that does ag. So it's, it's been really heartening and really interesting to see that shift um, to agri-solar. That, that's been a big change. Um, I I would say that we we still don't know a lot because we do a lot of case studies, um, and we may be having a lot of case study bias. So um, cases are selected for various reasons, and they may not be that representative. And I think going forward, we need to do more um, uh, representative uh, samples to get a clearer picture of how things track over time. I think, as well as I think, as I noted it's really important to be doing these long-term studies uh, really with, and with the, the, same, the same people. We, we do that a lot in health. Uh, we haven't really done that in energy and climate and, and that would be really important. Yeah, I think uh, looking at like the residential customer, there's lots of data showing the increase in folks stalling their own rooftop solar and participating in community solar and green pricing programs. So I think that will just continue to grow. I was going to say the same thing, Eileen. It's just become so much more accessible to lower income pe people and we're in Montana and I just see a huge boom of solar in our area uh, and it's been great to see. And it, a lot of it's because of the pricing coming down and the accessibility, a lot more installers and just more people involved in renewables. 